Hey there, everybody. This is George from DinosaurGeorge.com. Today's episode highlighted item is item number 3521. It is an Allosaurus finger. It's the second digit. This is, this is kind of a cool piece. Um, it is the second digit, uh, second finger from an Allosaurus. Relatively big piece, but very nice, very well done. It retails for $30, and you can find it on our website uh, if you like this particular item. Go to the website and in the search box on the catalog, just type in 3521 and it'll take you right to it. Or look around and see if there's anything else that you like. All right, let's jump into this. Brandon from Morris, New York. Hey, DG, I'm glad you're back. I'm glad to be back, Brandon. Brandon, Brandon, not Brandon, Brandon. Sorry, buddy. My question is about Indominus Rex from the movie Jurassic World. What did you think about it? I thought it was kind of interesting. It was kind of cool looking. Um, I think it was sort of a, a jazzed up Tyrannosaurus Rex with the Spinosaurus kicker, but, <laughs> but I think it was sort of a cool looking thing. All right, Jaden from Cedro Woolley, Washington. Hey, DG, hope you're doing great, and I'm glad you started, to ask, uh, started the Ask DG again. I've always been a fan. Thank you, Jaden. That's very kind of you. Glad to be able to do it. My question is, can you be a Christian and a paleontologist? And my second question, how do I become a paleontologist? Sorry, there's no dino questions. Thanks, DG. <laughs> you don't have to ask specifically dinosaur questions, Jaden. Okay. Can you be a Christian and can you be a paleontologist? Absolutely you can. There is nothing that stops a Christian from being a paleontologist. I think the only, um, the only issue is Christianity is based more on faith and paleontology is based on science. And sometimes the two don't mesh very well. So I would say that there are a huge number of paleontologists in this world who are also Christians or they believe in God and yet they're very effective paleontologists. So I would just say that when you have a faith-based interest, you make sure that it doesn't play a larger role than the science. In other words, all things can't be answered by simply saying, because that's the way God made them, because that's not really a scientific or an effective answer. Uh, if we don't know the answers to some things, that's okay. But um, there is no reason why you cannot be a Christian and be a paleontologist. For your second question, what do you have to do to become a paleontologist? Well, Jaden, uh, depending on your age, either now you want to start looking at colleges as a place to continue your education to become a paleontologist. Um, if you are in a younger grade than high school, then the things that you definitely want to focus on are things like biology courses, if you can take one. Uh, but also, if there's one piece of advice I can give you, it would be to learn the metric system. Because in paleontology, we don't discuss things in feet and inches. It is the metric system. So become familiar with the metric system and that will help you if you happen to be young. All right, Kyle from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Hey, DG, how's your traveling museum going? Kyle, it's going very well. We are packing right now. We're leaving in a couple of weeks for a one-week tour into Florida with it. And so I'm very excited about that. I was wondering if Allosaurus, Epantereus, and Saurophaganax are the same animal. Do you think they had polymorphism to help identify each other? Okay. Allosaurus, Epantereus, and Saurophaganax. Uh, a lot of debate whether those are indeed different animals or if Epantereus and Saurophaganax are the same animal, but they're not an Allosaurus. They are definitely Allosaurid, meaning they have the same basic features as an Allosaurus. But um, I, I had a conversation once with Dr. Robert Bacher who went into great detail about why he believes that Saurophaganax is not Allosaurus. So, um, so I feel pretty confident that everything I've heard about Saurophaganax, he is indeed different enough to be classified as something other than Allosaurus specifically. Now, if the three of those are indeed individuals and they are all living at the same time in the same place, there must have been something other than size that allowed other members of their family to recognize them from a distance. And so there probably were things, whether that was color, whether it was feather configuration, whether it was the distinctiveness of the skull, something clearly differentiated them because they have to be able to know who someone is from a distance. Look at the African plains today with the variety of different horn configurations from antelope. They want to be able to tell who is a member of their group from a distance. And so I would imagine these three dinosaurs did the same thing. 
Zane from Bristol. And by the way, guys, you notice I'm going pretty quickly. I'm going to try to speed it up to get more questions answered. I've got to speed these things up because there's just too many of you and I don't have enough time. Okay, Zane from Bristol, Indiana, dear Mr. Blassing. How tall is Tyrannosaurus Rex from head to toe? Thank you for your time and have a great day. Zane, thank you for calling me mister. But again, to everyone out there, I do not mind being called George or Dinosaur George or DG or whatever you like, but I do appreciate the courtesy, Zane, that speaks highly of you. Okay, how tall is it? Now here's the problem with how tall a dinosaur is. If we are referring to standard fl standing flat-footed in its normal, standard, everyday pose, then it's going to be different than if it is leaning upright or standing a little taller. And the problem is we cannot say with certainty what is the comfortable way that they stood. Did they stand with their body perfectly out directly below their legs or were they at an angle or were they down? So that thing cannot be answered to an exact measurement. But I would say that the average suggested height is about 20 feet. So maybe it's 20 feet tall uh, when it's standing flat-footed. Okay, Mitchell from Wales. Hello, Dinosaur George. My question is about my favorite prehistoric animal, Dunkleosteus. Dunkleosteus was, if, if Dunkleosteus was able to evolve further, would it be as big as a megalodon is, uh, as big as a megalodon is? I always ask myself and would like your opinion on that. Thank you for your time. Mitchell, happy to do it for you. If Dunkleosteus continued to evolve, would it ever reach the size of a megalodon? I don't think so, unless prey items living with it continue to evolve to gigantic proportions. Keep in mind, a, a predator is only as large as he has to be. They don't grow giant simply to grow giant. They grow giant to be able to take on prey that happens to live within their environment. So if other animals reached gigantic proportions along with Dunkleosteus, then yes, he probably would have evolved to become a little bigger. But I don't think he ever would have reached the gigantic size of Megalodon. So I, I suspect he would have been bigger, but I don't know how big he would have gotten. But that's sort of an interesting question, Mitchell. All right, Luke from Astoria, Oregon. Hey, DG, how's it going? Going good, buddy. How are you? I heard many times that pterosaurs and marine reptiles are not dinosaurs. Can you explain why that is? Luke, um, dinosaurs fit in a certain family. You have to divide animals and plant life into individual families so that um, scientists have a better understanding of where they came from. And pterosaurs and sea reptiles, the biggest difference between they and dinosaurs is the configuration of their hips, the way their legs come down from their body. Dinosaurs' legs are held directly under their body, more mammalian-like than, uh, than uh, reptilian-like, because reptiles' legs are out to the side. Swimming reptiles and pterosaurs' legs are out to the side of their body. So because of that very distinctive difference, they are put into a different category. Even though they live together at the same time in the same place, they are not considered dinosaurs, mainly because of that. Now there's some other variances throughout the body, different, different things that help determine what fits into a category, but that's the easiest and fastest way to answer your question. All right, Amar from Pilsen, Bohemia in the Czech Republic. Hey, Mr. Blessing, I wanted to know if you find it annoying as me when people describe feathered dinosaurs as giant angry chickens. I'm going to answer that question first, Amar. <laughs> it, it, it becomes frustrating when people always say T-Rex is just a giant chicken. But the reason for that is because um, the way... Uh, the media works, they're always going to compare something to another animal that the general public can identify with. So in one aspect, it's good because people are beginning to realize that predatory dinosaurs, theropods, are bird related. So that's a good thing. But it is frustrating that of all the birds in the world, we would choose a chicken. Why not choose a cassowary? Why not choose a roadrunner? Why not choose, uh, I think it's called a seriyama. I think that's the name of the bird. It's actually got a a raptor-like hook on its foot. So I think we should use better examples, eagles, owls, hawks, kites, falcons, but chickens seem to be the choice the media uses and uses it as the most recognizable comparison, and therefore 
I am okay with the fact that people think Tyrannosaurus Rex is a giant chicken. I know it's frustrating, but there's good in that. Okay, as for a second question, I want to know if a pack of dromaeosaurids would raid a T-Rex nest, eat their kids, and when the parents would return, would be able to pick, off the, uh, pick up the scent of the raptors. Thank you for answering my questions and have a nice day. Thank you, Amar. I hope you have a nice day as well. Okay. Predatory animals kill other predatory animals, especially if they find unprotected young. Not so much to eat them, but to eliminate the competition. You don't want a baby Tyrannosaurus to reach adulthood because then it becomes an adult Tyrannosaurus, and that's a bad thing for everybody. So yes, I do believe that they would attempt to kill unprotected young, but would the adults come back and find the nest and find the babies and then pick up the scent of the raptors and track them down to seek uh, revenge? I don't think so, because animals' brains don't work like humans. Um, uh, revenge is a, is a feature mostly, solely applied to higher mental capacity animals like humans. So I don't think Tyrannosaurs would have thought that way. They're very reactionary. If their babies were being attacked, they would defend the babies. But I don't think they would go looking for payback if somebody came in and wiped out their young. I think they would kill raptors anytime, anywhere, simply, again, to get rid of the competition. All right, uh, Varen or Varen from Central Valley, New York. Hello, DG. I hope you remember me from Texas. Ah, Varen, I do remember you from the great state of Texas. My question is, is it possible that Spinosaurus evolved into a fully aquatic oceanic dinosaur? Thanks. Well, Varen, um, I don't think that, well, who knows? Listen, um, you know, whales started off as a wolf-like creature, the Masonicids, the Mesonicids, I believe that's still the, the theory. And so as they spent more time in aquatic environments, their body became better designed for an aquatic environment. So yeah, you know, I think they would have continued on the path of becoming very aquatic, meaning they might have ultimately lost their front and back legs and their tails may have become their main use for propulsion. So yeah, actually I think they, they may have done that. It would be cool to see a fully aquatic, um, a fully aquatic Spinosaurus. The one thing to keep in mind though, is um, that when you hunt in lakes and rivers, I don't think you're as likely to evolve solely to stay in an aquatic environment because of the limitations of space. Obviously there's giant lakes, but not all of them. Spinosaurus seems to be better suited for lakes and rivers and not an oceanic environment. So the ocean would allow for it to, to evolve dramatically, whereas freshwater lakes and rivers, it probably would have had a more subtle evolutionary trend. All right, that's it. If you guys have a question, go to my website today. We are shooting nine of these, and that's going to almost answer all the questions we've gotten up through today. And today is Wednesday, September 2nd. So if you submitted a question prior to Wednesday, September the 2nd, chances are very good that yours is getting ready to be answered in the next several of these. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you shortly.